Good morning and welcome to Cardiology Grand Rounds. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Deepak Bhatt as our speaker. Dr. Bhatt is the Executive Director of Interventional Cardio Cardiovascular Programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He has authored an astonishing number of peer-reviewed publications and is one of the most recognized names in interventional cardiology. Today, he'll change gears a bit and speak to us on improving outcomes in atrial fibrillation with optimal antiarrhythmic approaches, Dr. Butt. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pressman, for that kind introduction. It's really great to be with all of you. I've um, uh, really uh, enjoyed the opportunity to visit programs, especially in, in cities I, I've lived in. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that can't happen. But I'm glad to be able to join you virtually and uh, really commend you, uh, especially those of you in training and uh, on the front lines as we're dealing with this pandemic. Thank you for everything that you're doing. So I'll be speaking today about atrial fibrillation and really the wide spectrum of it uh, and all the different aspects in terms of epidemiology, in terms of therapeutics and so forth. Uh, you already uh, heard uh, from Dr. Pressman uh, who I am and what I'm up to. Uh, this program specifically uh, is one that has been provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and HMP Company, uh, folks that I've worked with uh, through several years. They are also, among uh, many other things, uh, in charge of publishing the Journal of Invasive Cardiology, which I edit, uh, where we cover both interventional and electrophysiology topics. Uh, this educational program is supported by a grant from Sanofi US. I'll also mention, if you have any questions along the way, if you could just go ahead and type them into the right sidebar, and at the end, I will go through all those questions. So. Uh, write them down or enter them in the chat box as you're thinking about them. That way you won't forget. And I'll try to bundle them at the end and answer them efficiently. So the learning objectives for today for the CME program are to describe the pathological processes responsible for the initiation and perpetuation of atrial fibrillation, to evaluate new and emerging clinical and real world data regarding the efficacy and safety of antiarrhythmic drugs, to implement guideline directed management and therapy for patients with AF, and to develop personalized treatment strategies that are informed by patient specific characteristics and importantly by patient preferences. So before getting started in terms of the actual treatment of atrial fibrillation and all the latest sorts of advances, I think it's important to just step back and acknowledge that there are a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation out there and their number is growing. Uh, this slide shows a variety of different sources, uh, various uh, Olmsted County data, for example, different registry data, uh, marketing data, all, Medicare data, all sorts of different data. But the bottom line is even though the specific numbers uh, might not be exactly the same, the trend lines are, there's going to be a lot more atrial fibrillation by 2030, by 2050. So in terms of millions of people living with atrial fibrillation, this is definitely an area of growth. So regardless of what you might be interested in, whether it's internal medicine broadly, whether it's cardiology, whether it's cardiac electrophysiology, you're going to be taking care of people with atrial fibrillation. So in terms of various numbers and factoids, the number of people affected by atrial fibrillation. First of all, it's kind of hard to get these numbers because it's not as though uh, we have a, a way of screening everyone currently for atrial fibrillation. So we don't actually really know, but uh, a minimum several million people in the US, about 2% or so of the population appear to have atrial fibrillation worldwide. The worldwide number here is likely quite an underestimate, you know, over 30 million. As you know, atrial fibrillation increases with aging, and it also increases with chronic heart disease. That's true of ischemic heart disease. It's especially true of heart failure. And there's frequently other comorbidities that travel with atrial fibrillation, which is in part what makes its management so challenging. It is associated with stroke, heart failure, and death. 
And in fact, the data supporting those links for stroke go back many years in terms of causality. The data for heart failure and for sudden cardiac death, for example, are relatively more recent. But those associations, in fact, I'd say that causality is pretty well demonstrated at this point. It's the most common arrhythmia requiring hospitalization, about four to 500,000 hospital discharges a year. So there's a huge economic impact of atrial fibrillation beyond just the impact on patients. The median age of people coming in with atrial fibrillation is 75 years. So a lot of these patients are older, as you know, and see in clinical practice. And all these numbers are likely a vast underestimate because much of atrial fibrillation is silent. And uh, in the SPAF-3 study, for example, 45% of patients had atrial fibrillation detected incidentally. So there's a lot of atrial fibrillation out there. And I imagine we're going to see even more of it for the reasons I mentioned, aging population, et cetera, but also because so many people have an Apple Watch or you know, an increasing number of wearables that will detect atrial fibrillation with varying degrees of accuracy. But nonetheless, there's gonna be a lot more people showing up for AF evaluation and therefore greater detection. As far as atrial fibrillation goes, it can uh, occur once and uh, never again, maybe after a uh, holiday weekend of, of binge drinking, for example, or something, or it can more often be recurrent in which case it can be paroxysmal, and that's generally defined as terminating within a week or so. It can be persistent, where it requires a cardioversion, for example. It can be permanent, uh, where it is a situation where normal sinus rhythm can't be restored, or there is a purposeful decision made not to restore it. And all of this can be present or not with structural heart disease along with it. And that, of course, complicates management in particular complicates choice of antiarrhythmic drugs. As I mentioned before, there are lots of different conditions that travel along with atrial fibrillation, and many of them are listed here. Uh, things like aging, of course, but hypertension, male sex is a risk factor for more atrial fibrillation. Obesity uh, is a, I would say, relatively recently described risk factor for atrial fibrillation. The association has been in the literature for a while, but the quality of data suggesting that obesity, in fact, does have a causal role for atrial fibrillation, either in causing it or perpetuating it or enhancing the likelihood of a recurrence, say, after atrial fibrillation ablation procedures. You know, that literature has become much stronger and continues to grow. Uh, also, ischemic heart disease and heart failure, including heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what we used to call diastolic dysfunction, all seem to be associated with greater rates of atrial fibrillation. Obstructive sleep apnea is a big one as well. That's something that's also underdiagnosed, but there's a lot of it out there. Physical inactivity, uh, thyroid disease, everyone knows about as, as something to check for in people coming in with atrial fibrillation, and potentially inflammation, number of studies showing elevated inflammatory markers in people with atrial fibrillation and more likely to have recurrences of atrial fibrillation inflammatory markers like CRP and even IL-6, similar to the literature that's been described for atherosclerosis, but it does appear that inflammation may have a role in promoting atrial fibrillation. Well, you can say that pretty much about any disease state these days and inflammation. Uh, one other just semantic point I'll make, a lot of these slides and a lot of literature talks about non-valvular atrial fibrillation. The definition varies a little bit from study to study and time to time, but it in general refers to atrial fibrillation in the absence of rheumatic mitral stenosis, in the absence of an artificial valve, in particular a mechanical valve uh, or mitral valve repair. And that's where conditions with, uh, those are all conditions where anticoagulation with a, a NOAC, that is a novel uh, oral anticoagulant, sometimes called a DOAC, a direct acting oral anticoagulant, are in general not always approved, though there is also uh, some variation in terms of that. A number of the studies, in fact, of uh, the NOACs did include patients with some of these conditions, but for sure not rheumatic mitral stenosis, for sure not severe mitral stenosis from any cause, and for sure not mechanical uh, heart valves. Those are all situations where uh, no acts have either not been studied well or have been shown, as in the case of mechanical heart valves, to be inferior uh, to uh, Warford. So uh, that's why the non-valvular AF designation is in the literature and permeates it so much. It really had to do with no acts and where they can and can't be used or where they have and haven't been studied.
So in terms of atrial fibrillation, it causes and is associated with an atrial cardiomyopathy, that is an atrial cardiomyopathy can beget AF and vice versa, AF can lead to an atrial cardiomyopathy. Sometimes that can happen in an obvious way if the atrial fibrillation is completely out of control in terms of the rate and a patient has tachycardia that can uh, lead to a, a ventricular uh, uh, myopathy, but it can also lead to an atrial myopathy. And uh, that's one of the reasons that controlling the rate can be useful other than for symptomatic purposes to try to prevent this from happening, where all sorts of electrical and mechanical remodeling, even endothelial changes can occur and comorbidities such as the ones I already described, things like hypertension and heart failure and diabetes can further exacerbate any sort of atrial cardiomyopathy. And there's a lot of different things that can happen to those atrial cells, things like inflammation that I mentioned before, fibrosis, apoptosis, uh, endothelial dysfunction. So a number of different things that can further alter the compliance of that atrium, make it less likely that it will remodel favorably, even if normal sinus rhythm is restored for a period of time or permanently. So the atrial fibrillation can cause the atrial cardiomyopathy and vice versa and vice versa. There are a lot of ways that atrial fibrillation can present, as you know, at least those of you that have uh, been on the wards and taken care of atrial fibrillation patients or seen them in your outpatient clinics. And uh, there's a lot of variation between patients, but there's also a lot of variation within a patient. Now, sometimes uh, physicians think, oh, you know, this patient always knows when he or she has atrial fibrillation because they feel palpitations or dizzy or they're always symptomatic. That's actually not true. There's within a patient times they can be symptomatic and other times they have their atrial fibrillation, they're completely asymptomatic. And of course, between patients, there's always variation in everything, atrial fibrillation uh, as well. And if one is wearing a continuous monitor, many of these things that I mentioned uh, are apparent in particular that patients with symptomatic AF also often have a lot of asymptomatic AF. That's why you can't rely on symptoms in terms of deciding I'm going to anticoagulate this patient. That's why you can't say, oh, the patient had a successful atrial fibrillation ablation, I'm going to stop their anticoagulation. It's because a lot of the AFib, even in people that have symptomatic AFib, is also punctuated by asymptomatic AF episodes. The symptoms when they do occur uh, often occur from the rapid rate and can include things like being dizzy, dyspneic, having chest discomfort, having palpitations, of course, any or all or some of those can be present in an individual patient. So that is often from a rapid rate. Also, the irregular rhythm itself can cause symptoms like palpitations and in patients that are a bit hemodynamically tenuous to begin with, such as with a diminished ejection fraction or heart failure, even with a preserved ejection fraction, the AFib and that irregularity can further tip them over. Probably one of the reasons why restoration of normal sinus rhythm appears to be particularly useful in those that have heart failure. So uh, whether to treat the patient or not in general, if the rate is rapid, you would want to treat. And if the rhythm is irregular, whether to treat or not has been a longstanding area of controversy with the pendulum swinging back and forth and perhaps uh, flipping every 10 years or so. Patients with atrial fibrillation can also complain of fatigue. In this circumstance, usually just controlling the rate doesn't do the trick. Uh, oftentimes their rhythm control uh, is needed. And you know, fatigue's a tough one, right? Because a, a lot of different things can cause fatigue, but certainly in a patient who doesn't have that symptom when their normal sinus rhythm and does when they're in atrial fibrillation, it's probably true, true and related. And just to underscore importantly, in all patients with atrial fibrillation, you do wanna manage the risk for thromboembolic events. So-called subclinical atrial fibrillation or silent AF is also epidemic, as I mentioned before, with the utilization of implantable devices such as ICDs and suitable cardiac monitors. Uh, other sorts of devices, it's become quite apparent that there's a lot of silent atrial fibrillation out there. And uh, there are some genetic predisposing factors, demographic factors like being older. Uh, certainly there are ways of picking it up. Uh, biomarker elevations such as inflammatory markers seem to be associated with it. And depending on how you might then enrich a population, such as by age or, or presence of biomarkers, the incidence uh, can be really quite high uh, in enriched populations, such as say a post-cardiac surgery population, in some cases as high as uh, 
uh, if you're following patients long-term and with sensitive modalities. What to do with this sort of information though remains a big area of controversy and whether to even obtain this information in the first place in general uh, is uh, also controversial, even in specific circumstances such as post-cardiac surgery. It's a, a bit controversial what to do. I would say though, regardless of what you feel about that sort of monitoring of people that are asymptomatic or otherwise healthy or at high risk, in a sense, I would say it doesn't matter what you think or what I think because it is coming. That is, it's only a matter of time before everybody has various wearables that do detect heart rate and heart rhythm abnormalities, again, with varying degrees of success, though I think the success and accuracy will improve over the next five to 10 years. And as the cost of these devices come down, as people just want to have them, uh, regardless of what we might think as physicians in terms of saying, oh, you know, don't do that sort of random testing in asymptomatic people, uh, some people think we should do that sort of testing. But even if you think it's a total uh, waste and will escalate healthcare costs and calls to the office and, and physician anxiety, again, it doesn't really matter what you or I think. It's going to happen. It's already happening. As far as evidence for subclinical AF, there are a number of studies. I'll you know mention a few of them. The Reveal AF is an example of one sort of study. What the relevant amount of silent AF is before risk of various events such as thromboembolism goes up is, is a bit controversial in the literature. I'll come back to that, but at least in Reveal AF, defining AF episodes as lasting greater than or equal to six minutes uh, in a, a high-risk population, look at the rate of detection of atrial fibrillation, 40% at 30 months. So, you know, there's uh, potentially, again, in high-risk populations, lots of silent AF going on. Though lots will depend on whether you say six minutes or less or, or greater than that threshold, but at least at the six minute threshold in that study, lots of silent AFib. Okay, well, let's talk now a bit about therapies for atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of options to consider. And as far as things that I think are important to focus on, pretty much in everybody control of the ventricular rate is important that can typically be achieved with pharmacological means. Rarely things like AV node ablation and pacing are needed. Rhythm control may be necessary in some patients for symptom control, antiarrhythmic drugs and or catheter ablation procedures or less frequently surgical ablation procedures can be useful in that regard. And really important is the prevention of thromboembolism. That is typically done with oral anticoagulants. These days, it's typically done with the NOAX and not warfarin. And I would say increasingly, it's being done with various devices uh, that uh, ligate the left atrial uh, appendage or occlude it. And sometimes even surgical procedures to do this, especially if a patient is otherwise getting a surgical procedure like a valve surgery or a cabbage. So lots of different approaches, each with various degrees of data. The NOACs have a ton of data. The uh, percutaneous methods of left atrial appendage occlusion have uh, some data. Uh, the surgical approaches in terms of randomized data have very little, but nevertheless, the use of these approaches, all of them uh, are increasing. Which therapy to use, of course, as in all facets of medicine is a challenge. And, and the goal, of course, is to try to maximize the benefit to the patient, minimize the risks, and try to make that uh, calculation based on the best available data, uh, realizing that that is also quite fluid in terms of new data coming out all the time. It's important to try to figure out if there is an underlying predisposing etiology to the atrial fibrillation to assess the patient risk factors that might raise, say, their embolic risk, and therefore you've got to give them a thorough once over. That always includes a history. That includes family history, since we now do know there's a genetic component to atrial fibrillation. Obviously, it includes calculation of the chads vast score. So even though there are a lot of risk scores in medicine, even though physicians typically don't use them, chads vast is an exception to that. There, you really do want to calculate that and hopefully have an electronic health record that helps facilitate doing that. But if not, use your um, iPhone or whatever uh, sort of uh, personal device you've got to uh, download a calculator and be able to do that yourself. Uh, physical exam, always uh, important. Uh, blood work, uh, electrolytes, CBC, TSH, that's sort of the minimum sort of screening that's needed in the evaluation of atrial fibrillation. 
electrocardiogram, obviously, echocardiogram, obviously, potentially stress testing if coronary artery disease is suspected based on the history and physical. Uh, I don't know that needs to be done as a routine in folks with atrial fibrillation, though in point of fact, it typically does get done if someone shows up to a cardiologist uh, with atrial fibrillation as the main diagnosis of concern. The other part where stress testing can be useful is in terms of rate control, because of course, in general, we're titrating drugs to the rate at rest but in fact, it really is important uh, to make sure the response to exercise is such that if the AFib is uh, being rate controlled, uh, but seems to be well controlled at rest, but is out of control with exercise, well, that means something further needs to be done. Likewise, in folks that potentially have tachybrady syndrome, want to make sure that patients can elevate their heart rate with exercise appropriately. Otherwise, that could be the cause of some of their symptoms, such as fatigue. And in general, an x-ray is also recommended just to screen for things like pulmonary disease, uh, I suppose heart failure as well, though you'd be getting an echocardiogram anyway. Lifestyle modification is extremely important, uh, but not really emphasized to the way it is, say, for coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease, where we always talk about lifestyle. But as it turns out, it is at least equally important to atrial fibrillation. A lot of atrial fibrillation risk is indeed modifiable, but just as with, say, hypertension, for example. Now, if you live long enough, the risks still go up. But if uh, even you are uh, genetically or otherwise predisposed to get atrial fibrillation, you can delay the time of that onset by appropriate lifestyle modification. So in that matter, very analogous to hypertension uh, or even diabetes. So uh, quitting smoking is always a good idea and uh, can decrease AF by 36%. So even if one is talking specifically about AF, a lot of benefits to quitting smoking, obviously other health benefits as well. Controlling hypertension might reduce atrial fibrillation risk. There's some data supporting that. Alcohol actually raises the risk of AF pretty substantially. I think everybody has seen the uh, holiday uh, heart sort of system syndrome where people come in after, you know, maybe it was um, a Super Bowl or or a holiday weekend or something, lots of uh, drinking, lots of oftentimes salt intake, and you know that can precipitate heart failures, can precipitate, precipitate atrial fibrillation, it can precipitate both. So as it turns out, alcohol really is a potent driver in a number of observational studies of atrial fibrillation risk. Now, uh, patients don't like to hear that, even doctors may not like to hear that, but that's what the data show. And as it turns out, it is true even with one drink a day, uh, so that increases the risk of AF by about 10% in relative terms. Uh, so uh, if somebody is really trying to avoid AFib or has it and wants to do natural things and not take medications, well, then cutting down or abstaining from alcohol is definitely on that list. You know, another thing is that it's been a change in terms of the recommendations uh, relatively recently that a lot of people don't know. The old teaching used to be, you know, in terms of just drinking in general, no more than two drinks a day for men and one drink uh, for women. That's actually been downgraded for men. So it really is no more than a drink a day for men or women now. Uh, in terms of stimulants, uh, obviously uh, different adrenergic drugs, sports drinks, those sorts of things can trigger AFib. Uh, caffeine as well, I believe can trigger atrial fibrillation. That too is uh, surprisingly controversial in, in the literature. It's one of the risks of observational research. You can uh, get contradictory answers, but I would say the bulk of data do support uh, caffeine as a potential trigger for atrial fibrillation in certain patients. Now, not in everybody, but in certain patients, it does seem to be temporally associated with atrial fibrillation triggering or burden of AF. Also, a lot of times, excessive caffeine intake goes along with other things that predispose to atrial fibrillation, like sleep deprivation. And um, as far as that goes, uh, in that subcomponent of people who have obstructive sleep apnea, treating the obstructive sleep apnea may reduce atrial fibrillation burden as well, and is just a good idea to do anyway to treat the sleep apnea and the problems it causes. That's also an underdiagnosed, undertreated entity. A Mediterranean diet and a healthy diet in general, there's some evidence that that can uh, reduce AF burden. Uh, diabetes as well is something that can increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. And maybe some treatments for diabetes uh, can reduce atrial fibrillation risk. There's some data, for example, we saw it in Declare, 
where it appeared that SGLT2 inhibition uh, might uh, reduce uh, the atrial fibrillation uh, burden. Uh, obesity, as I alluded to earlier, is a potent uh, 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 driver of atrial fibrillation beyond the aging population. I think that's one of the other reasons atrial fibrillation is increasing uh, so rapidly and in such uh, uh, large numbers. Stress management possibly also has a role in reducing AF and AF burden. There are studies, for example, showing meditation and yoga uh, might uh, be associated with less atrial fibrillation. Again, it's sort of like CAD and stress management, the literature a bit all over the place, but regardless of whether there's a true uh, uh, causality or association, always still a good idea to try to reduce stress to the extent possible. And uh, physical activity does also seem to reduce AF. So as it turns out, the advice that cardiologists give for CAD, a lot of that can just be given verbatim for AF, uh, which I think is a relatively recent appreciation. So the goals of AF therapy are several fold to improve survival, to reduce the sequela of atrial fibrillation, primarily stroke, but uh, other things I mentioned earlier too, to reduce hospitalizations. AFib hospitalizations are a significant cost driver to improve symptoms and quality of life, and potentially also to restore atrial function and reverse that atrial myopathy that I alluded to before. So those are all uh, important and worthwhile things to do. So treatment options for atrial fibrillation, let's talk about that uh, a little bit. I mentioned uh, the importance of rate control that can be done with calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, digitalis remains a great option if used carefully and at low dose, especially in patients with concomitant heart failure. I uh, do need to be careful, do need to monitor the renal function. If that's fluctuating, you may need to uh, be careful about the dose and back off. Uh, Non-pharmacological approaches also exist, such as ablation and pacing. That's rarely used these days, but every now and then uh, can still be useful. Uh, maintenance of sinus rhythm, another approach that can be done pharmacologically with the list of drugs shown there, things like flecainide, propafenone, sodalol, dofetilide, dronetarone, amiodarone. Uh, others potentially like renolazine, uh, which as you are aware is sometimes used as an antianginal. Uh, where it also appears to have some antiarrhythmic effects, uh, and beta blockers, um, uh, potentially, at least in those folks that have catecholamine-mediated atrial fibrillation. Obviously, they're primarily thought of as rate controlling, but, but in some respects can also potentially be useful in maintaining sinus rhythm. And then there are non-pharmacological approaches, catheter ablation uh, being the one that most of us think of, but also uh, pacing, surgery, and some implantable uh, devices. And then there's stroke prevention. Yeah, which is primarily pharmacological. Historically, with warfarin these days, you know, 80, 90% of new prescriptions are for the NOAX, dabigatran, bivaroxaban, apixaban primarily. Uh, every now and then, depending on the region of the world, adoxaban, that's more common in East Asia. Uh, and then non pharmacological approaches, including the removal and isolation of the left atrial appendage, as I also uh, alluded to before. So uh, let's just briefly uh, talk about a case here, a 66-year-old woman with a one-year history of paroxysmal AF lasting two to four hours. She's minimally symptomatic on once a day metoprolol succinate, 50 milligrams a day. Her ventricular rate during her AF on metoprolol is 110. That's not ideal, obviously. She has a history of hypertension, is post left carotid endarterectomy, but no history of heart failure, stroke, or MI. But Obviously, we know she has atherosclerosis if she needed a CA and probably uh, bad atherosclerosis, even if asymptomatic. She's on Losartan 50 milligrams a day and aspirin 81 milligrams a day. Uh, her TSH is normal. That's good to check. Her creatinine clearance is documented. That's important in terms of thinking of potential drugs, many of which are renally cleared in terms of antiarrhythmics, also in terms of the NOACs. Uh, her EKG currently shows sinus rhythm with a rate of 78. Um, she's got a normal QT interval. Uh, her echo shows an EF of 55%. LA diameter, a little generous there, 4.1 centimeter. Uh, no comment on diastolic parameters. Uh, her uh, stress nuclear study showed normal perfusion and EF, no evidence of ischemia. So, you know, this is a really common patient. What would you do with this sort of patient? Uh, what is the right thing to do? Should she... Um, be anticoagulated, for example. Well, I think that one is probably an easy one uh, where I would say yes. If she's anticoagulated, 
Should she also be on an aspirin a day for her endarterectomy that her interventionalist, or uh, I guess in this case, it wasn't a stent, so it was a vascular surgeon, might have started on? Well, I'd say probably not if she's on therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, does she need better rate control? Uh, I'd say so if her uh, ventricular rate uh, during AF is 110, probably uh, need to make sure uh, that uh, even though she's in sinus rhythm this instant, that that's not uh, an issue when she is uh, popping into AF. So a lot of different things uh, to consider here, uh, some of which we've discussed and some more that we'll discuss in a bit. Another sort of typical case, an 80-year-old man, uh, common age for atrial fibrillation, uh, presents to you after moving the area, complains of dyspnea on exertion, fatigue, has a five-year history of permanent atrial fibrillation, a rate on Holter monitor ranging from 76 to 148, an average of 120, that's not good. A history of hypertension, though no diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, heart failure, or stroke. His current meds include diltiazem, long-acting, 120 a day, and warfarin with a good INR. Uh, EKGs AF at a rate of 120. QTC is shown 430, no other abnormalities. Echo shows diffuse mild hypokinesis and EF of 45%. Mildly dilated LV and dilated LA. So what would you do for this sort of patient? Well, he's on anticoagulation, that's good. Seems to be tolerating it well, could take a don't rock the boat approach. On the other hand, 80, some risk of intracranial hemorrhage with warfarin could be reduced with a NOAC. The trials show even in patients switching from warfarin to a NOAC in a trial that the rate of intracranial hemorrhage is less. So I uh, could potentially uh, do that in him. For sure, his uh, rate needs some uh, method of better control, whether that's with more or different medications. Uh, are all potential options to consider. So speaking of all that, let's now talk about trials of rhythm and rate control in atrial fibrillation. There are a lot of them in the past, uh, as listed here. The AFFIRM trial in particular was one that was really practice changing. And the overall findings from these studies, to summarize, there's some subtlety to them, but the overall findings was that rhythm control was not superior to rate control, despite the fact that at the time all of us were well, maybe not all, but most of us were expecting uh, rhythm control to be winning because that's what nature intended for us to be in normal sinus rhythm. But that's not what randomized trials showed in the patients selected to enter into these randomized control trials. And it turned out rate control seemed to be the acceptable primary option. And patients with AF and risk factors, of course, uh, need to receive anticoagulation indefinitely. That was something we've learned through the years, even when sinus rhythm is restored uh, naturally, chemically, or uh, procedurally. So this learning from these trials that rate control uh, was the winner, even with these trials in hand, it was important to realize that it wouldn't apply to every patient as is the case with randomized clinical trials. They never applied to every patient. And for very symptomatic patients, despite rate control, obviously you need to do something about their rhythm. Young patients, at least uh, I know I was always a bit uncomfortable just saying, uh, don't worry about the AFib, it'll be okay to just rate control you. In patients who uh, exercise tolerance is impaired, their, uh, uh, the rate control strategy alone may be insufficient. Where rate control has initially been trial, tried, as the trial suggested, was the right approach and failed, well, there, of course, you need to escalate to rhythm control. And in patients with depressed LV function, there were, at, even at the time of these trials, some data to suggest uh, that just leaving them in atrial fibrillation wasn't going to be a good strategy. But the bottom line was to individualize therapy, but in general, start with rate control and anticoagulation. That was the dogma. And in terms of the guidelines, these are from 2014. In general, uh, the recommendation was if there is uh, no other CV disease, um, beta blocker, dilt, verapamil are reasonable. If there's hypertension or a HEFPEF, Again, beta blockers, dilt, verapamil. If there's LV dysfunction or heart failure, then beta blockers and digoxin, as I mentioned before, uh, move up in terms of possibilities. And in all three of these scenarios, that amiodarone uh, was a potential drug uh, to also add on. And in those with COPD, uh, you know, there were some uh, issues about beta blockers if there's no wheezing. But really, the larger message is you can, even in COPD patients, use beta blocker beta blockers for atrial fibrillation, as long as there's no active wheezing and as long as the asthma or COPD is well controlled. 
reasons to pursue rhythm control then in that era uh, was really just for improving patient symptoms more so than rate control alone could do. But the downside was additional uh, side effects potentially from the drug, sometimes serious additional financial costs. Um, but still, you know, there was some controversy about this because it was apparent that the longer one waits to restore normal sinus rhythm, the harder it is to restore sinus rhythm and potentially the lesser the benefits. So it still, you know, persisted this thought that maybe we should uh, do more than just uh, rhythm control as an initial, uh, rather rate control as an initial strategy, and maybe consider rhythm control either earlier or even as an initial strategy, despite uh, the set of trials such as Affirm that suggested doing that was not correct. And you know, the rationale for that, and some nice slide uh, from uh, Bernard Gersh from a few years back, was that uh, the longer you wait, uh, the worse off that atrium becomes. That is the greater the disease progression and duration of AF, uh, the harder it's going to be to ever restore and then maintain normal sinus rhythm. And these are some data that also support that concept that early intervention uh, is much more likely to lead to durable uh, normal sinus rhythm uh, than delaying the restoration of normal sinus rhythm. So if you're going to do it, there is some advantage to doing it earlier. Uh, and uh, along those lines, most recently, just uh, over the summer, uh, at the European Society of Cardiology came out the EAST AF net study. And what that trial did was randomize patients uh, within a year of their atrial fibrillation to either a strategy of early rhythm control in blue or the usual care in red. And here you'll see a significant 21% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular events. And the composite I'm referring to here is death stroke or serious adverse events related to rhythm control. So uh, I think this trial showed what a lot of us wanted it to show and wanted to believe is true. And, and even though there are some uh, caveats and limitations to this trial, as is the case with all trials, uh, I, I think fundamentally it, it does prove uh, what uh, uh, many of us believe that uh, early rhythm control uh, if it can be accomplished safely and without side effects, it is a good strategy uh, for many patients. And uh, here is the breakdown of different events. Uh, these are uncorrected hazard ratios, but cardiovascular death, for example, was lower, heading in the right direction. And you know, one can quibble about uh, p-values, but I would say is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, as well, stroke is significantly reduced. Hospitalization for heart failure, again, one can quibble about the confidence interval crossing uh, unity there, but I would say is you know, significantly uh, reduced. And hospitalization for ACS, not significantly reduced, but again, it's directionally consistent. So uh, to me, it does seem like there's a beneficial effect across all these different endpoints. And the consistency reassures me that you know, regardless of the one considers the p-value significant or not, or uh, considers that the confidence intervals are close to one, or these are uncorrected hazard ratios, I, I think the findings are likely real. Uh, as well, something uh, that, is, or, uh, that is important to uh, uh, look at is how sinus rhythm uh, is restored and uh, its rates over the course of the study. The bottom line is that there are more patients in sinus rhythm in blue with early rhythm control than with usual care in red, and that this is true for the duration of the study. Uh, so this contrast, a difference in uh, sinus rhythm of about 20%, 60 to versus 80% at the 24-month uh, mark, is what led to these associated outcomes. Perhaps if that contrast were even larger, well, then the benefits would be even greater than what I just described in the preceding slide. So what do we do then where we have the AFFIRM trial so embedded in our collective thinking and the guidelines, uh, and now East AF, uh, both uh, well done trials, uh, slightly different eras, but uh, about 20 years apart, but still uh, both excellent trials, both published in New England Journal of Medicine. Well, there's some key differences. I think the primary one is that in East uh, AFNet, the initiation of rhythm control was relatively early. And I think that does make a difference for the reasons I mentioned. If you just let that atrial fibrillation uh, linger, you know, the uh, atrium uh, doesn't really uh, like it. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, that can have lots of consequences. You know, Dr. Pressman, for example, asked us if the atrial myopathy or the irregular rhythm and stasis that causes clot formation. Well, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, it's primarily the irregular uh, rhythm, but we've all done TEs where we see folks with some degree of atrial enlargement or uh, atrium that's not uh, you know, fully uh, normally contractile where we see this sort of smoke. And, you know, I, I, I think it's all a continuum. Uh, and uh, if we are, on the other hand, restoring heart rhythms uh, to a normal sinus earlier on, uh, you know, it does potentially prevent uh, that atrium from remodeling and not only reduces future AF burden, but potentially also modulates that stroke risk. Uh, uh, you know, some of that, uh, there's evidence to support some of it's more conjectural. There's some differences in the trial locations. The firm was uh, really a North American trial, East really a European trial. I don't think that that should matter so, so much uh, though. Uh, there was a uh, more persistent AF in a firm because of the uh, fact that there was early initiation of rhythm control in East. Uh, the two sort of go uh, hand in hand. There was a bit more hypertension and heart disease in general in East uh, than in a firm. Uh, there was a, a lot more dronetarone and catheter ablation use in East AF than in a firm, of course, because those modalities uh, weren't in play at the time of a firm. So maybe that accounts for some of it, that is it's better rhythm control than was achieved in uh, a firm, uh, maybe more safely done. Digoxin use was much higher in a firm, so that's probably a strike against it, despite my somewhat favorable comments of digoxin in general that can cause trouble, especially if you're not really familiar with its use in these days, not as many people are, are familiar with using it. Uh, there was a, a much higher use of Solol and Amiodrone in a firm uh, than in East. No acts, of course, didn't exist at the time of a firm. Uh, their use was uh, quite prevalent in East. That could also have been a difference that was potentially um, uh, explaining some of the differences in these two trials. The uh, use of oral anticoagulation um, in, in uh, general, uh, in terms of uh, there being equivalent, uh, was uh, greater in the EAST trial. You know, all-cause mortality was the primary endpoint of a firm. That's a high bar to clear anywhere in medicine, including in cardiovascular medicine. Sometimes we expect a lot out of trials. It's very hard to alter mortality, especially if there's good background therapy. Uh, whereas in East, it was a composite endpoint, as I alluded to before, and I think that's probably uh, more uh, relevant to look at a broad array of cardiovascular complications and not just all-cause mortality. Uh, rhythm control was associated with higher hospitalizations in the AFFIRM trial that uh, worked against the rhythm control strategy, of course, uh, and the safety outcomes were uh, no different in the two arms of the study in East, so that was a plus there. Uh, there was a, a bit of an issue with loss to follow up in, in, in East, though, again, I think overall the trial was well done. Wouldn't really hold that against it so much. So then, uh, you know, when might we consider uh, rate control? When might we consider rhythm control? Uh, in symptomatic AF, we might favor uh, rhythm control more in patients uh, that are uh, younger and are going to have AF potentially for decades. We might favor rhythm control a bit more. If it's early on, first episode of AF, that's perhaps the time, if you believe East, to really intervene and not wait too long until the atrium has remodeled. Uh, so in patients that haven't had prior cardioversions, you know, that is the time perhaps to actually consider rhythm control. And in folks that uh, just prefer it, that's always been a good reason to consider rhythm control. Now, the Vaughn Williams classification of antiarrhythmic drugs um, may not be quite as popular uh, these days, but I think it's worth knowing. Uh, it, it still does crop up, I think, in board exams. So uh, especially for those of you that are trainees, uh, you know, take a look for the sake of time. I'm not going to work uh, through this anymore, but it certainly does uh, provide a context in which to understand mechanisms of action of drugs that I think is still useful. Uh, with respect to use of antiarrhythmic drugs, um, uh, realize that the, the goals are to try to reduce the frequency and duration and severity of, of events. But at the same time, we have to minimize the risk of treatment. And a lot of the different antiarrhythmic drugs uh, do have some issues. The efficacy of most antiarrhythmic drugs is modest in the 40 to 60% range. Uh, amiodrones may be a little bit higher, at least in some studies, but really want to be aware of safety and tolerability issues. And tolerance uh, tends to be highest for 
things like dofetilide and dronetarone and flecainide and propafenone and sodalol, assuming they're dosed appropriately. I do want to worry about proarrhythmic risk in class 1C drugs when there's structural heart disease. Uh, so think about that. Uh, keep an eye on the QT interval. A number of these different drugs do prolong the QT interval, and that can obviously predispose uh, to lethal ventricular arrhythmias. I think about organ toxicity. In particular, I'm talking about amiodarone and pulmonary and hepatic issues that come up, need to monitor for that. Uh, think about the effects on uh, sinus node and sinus rhythm and the conduction system. And uh, factor in LV dysfunction as well. Uh, and uh, dofetilide and amiodarone perhaps have the best sort of safety profiles in that circumstance. Uh, this slide summarizes the efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs in the AF trials. And as you can see, as I just alluded to, uh, with all these different drugs, it's pretty modest. Uh, but uh, sometimes if you try drugs serially, uh, you can find something that for a particular patient does work in them. Whether to initiate antiarrhythmics in the inpatient or outpatient setting uh, really depends on what sort of system you're practicing in, uh, medical legal concerns, uh, uh, what the local standard of care is defined as. Uh, but in general, uh, a number of the drugs, uh, the historical advice has been uh, to start them if the patient's in atrial fibrillation, to start them in the hospital setting, in some cases, even if they're in normal uh, sinus rhythm, uh, to start them uh, in the inpatient setting. Uh, I, I must say, in, in recent years, with all the pressures on uh, reducing hospitalization, a lot of times uh, this advice is not actually followed anymore. If you start patients on antiarrhythmic drugs, you do need to follow them up uh, closely for a number of different things. Uh, Prorhythmic uh, issues can arise late. It's not always soon after initiation of the drugs because risk factors can develop. Patients get older, or renal function may be diminished. And with amiodarone in particular, you do want to keep monitoring for uh, uh, toxicity over time. Uh, some of the specific things uh, that you want to monitor are LFTs, uh, TSH every six months or so, chest x-ray annually. PFTs of pulmonary toxicity is suspected, though I always get them at baseline, and I do tend to get them in follow-up as well, just to keep an eye on things. I have seen patients who may not have symptoms, but you know um, that's because they're not doing a lot and are, are developing pulmonary toxicity. So I actually think there's value in doing that for dronetarone uh, and for all of these, of course, you want to get uh, ECGs. Uh, for many of these, like dofetilide and sodalol, in particular, want to monitor the QT interval, also the renal function there in case that's fluctuating. And for class 1C agents such as flecainide and propafenone, be on the lookout for coronary artery disease or ventricular dysfunction. Uh, consider ECG uh, stress testing. Uh, and also echoes uh, at rest and potentially uh, stress testing as well, just to make sure the patient is a safe candidate for those forms of therapy. I'm just going to say a little bit about AF um, and catheter ablation. Uh, this is now a very mature uh, and uh, safe and effective and good hands way of uh, uh, treating atrial fibrillation, restoring normal sinus rhythm. The efficacy uh, has been improving in recent years. These are uh, data from about a decade ago, but in the time since the percentages have improved, there's still a need for repeat uh, AVF ablations. There is still variation from center to center and operator to operator, uh, but overall a safe, effective procedure. Uh, Castle AF by one of my uh, former colleagues at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Marouche, uh, looked at uh, a modest number of patients, a little under 400 patients with symptomatic uh, uh, paroxysmal AF or uh, with persistent AF, but importantly with an EF less than or equal to 35% randomized to catheter ablation versus drug therapy. And the overall trial was positive, showing a significant reduction in the primary endpoint of mortality and heart failure hospitalizations, about a 38% relative risk reduction, highly statistically significant. So, you know, this did, I think, uh, prove uh, conceptually that in particular in the heart failure patient atrial fibrillation, in atrial fibrillation, that uh, ablation uh, was particularly uh, valuable. As well, even if one looked at things like all-cause mortality, uh, there seemed to be uh, uh, endpoints uh, heading in the right direction. Same with CV mortality and increases in EF uh, accompanied ablation more so than drugs. So overall, it seemed to me in a modest sized trial, uh, but uh, one that I thought was well done, uh, good evidence uh, to strongly consider catheter ablation in that heart failure patient that has atrial fibrillation.
Uh, Cabana, of course, was a large trial, NIH-funded, uh, published in JAMA, uh, both the main trial and uh, some quality of life uh, data, showing uh, no significant difference in the primary endpoint of death, disabling stroke or serious bleeding or cardiac arrest in the intent to treat a population. But it is a complex trial, lots of subtlety uh, to it. For the sake of time, I can't really go through every issue uh, about it. But if one looks at uh, mortality or CV hospitalization, for example, by intention to treat, you know, there, uh, the uh, data are heading in the right direction, favoring catheter ablation. Um, and, you know, if uh, one looks at other secondary analyses, some recent work on treatment analyses, it did look like there were signals that uh, ablation might, in fact, uh, be better than uh, drug therapy. But, you know, we're sort of bound by the primary endpoint, and there, there was no significant reduction in the primary endpoint in an all-cause mortality. Once more, that's a high bar to clear. Uh, but it did uh, reduce uh, the composite of mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization, really the cardiovascular hospitalization drove that uh, by 14%, and almost a halving in uh, uh, recurrent atrial fibrillation uh, with ablation. So I, I think from a patient-centric view, it was a win. And, you know, compared to drug therapy in on uh, treatment analyses, there was a 33% reduction in the primary endpoint and even 40% lower mortality. Of course, on treatment analyses can bias things uh, uh, towards the drug or intervention being studied, in this case, the procedure of catheter ablation. But at a minimum, it showed that AF ablation uh, is an acceptable safe strategy uh, for the treatment of AF. And you know, if you really want a more detailed um, uh, sort of analysis, uh, uh, Christine and Albert and I wrote the accompanying editorial to Cabana where we point out, yeah, look, the trial overall might be called quote unquote negative, but, but if you're really uh, willing to delve into the data and, and look at things from a patient centric way, here we have a safe effective procedure that for patients with bad symptoms uh, can uh, be considered and perhaps should be considered sooner than it currently is. And if you have a more optimistic interpretation and uh, uh, are willing to you know, not be a statistical purist, in fact, there are signs that it actually uh, does reduce important events like hospitalizations for cardiovascular issues. So in the interest of time, uh, let me now just move on uh, to uh, summarize uh, as far as atrial fibrillation and stroke goes. Stroke's the most common uh, serious complication of atrial fibrillation. You all know that older patients in particular over 75 have a greater than five-fold increased risk of ischemic strokes uh, with atrial fibrillation versus those under 65. About 15 to 20% of strokes in the US are caused by atrial fibrillation. That's over 100,000 a year. The mortality in those strokes is about 25%. So. Uh, we don't often see those people um, that have those uh, fatal strokes because uh, they don't come to the outpatient cardiology clinic, but it, it is a major source of morbidity and mortality. So uh, something we really want to be aware of. The CHADS VAS score, really important as I alluded to. Hopefully you all know how to calculate that. Uh, and if you can't uh, memorize it, that's okay. Just download an app that will do it for you. The recommendations for uh, anticoagulation uh, are uh, to always assess the CHADS VAS score uh, and then to uh, anticoagulate patients appropriately based on that. You know, the bleeding risk scores, it depends which guidelines you're talking about. Um, they're not uniformly uh, recommended for bleeding risk assessment. In some guidelines they are, but the reality is their predictive value, the C statistic is actually kind of low. And aspirin is really not an appropriate treatment for atrial fibrillation. Anticoagulation is the way to go. If patients aren't treated with oral anticoagulation, the older data show just how high their stroke rates are. So this isn't, you know, like some of the things we do in cardiovascular medicine where the benefits are marginal. This is really a large impact intervention. And in general, there's some difference between the European and American guidelines. If a patient has a CHADS VAS score of one or greater, they really should be on an oral anticoagulant. Uh, the uh, European guidelines were a bit more aggressive in terms of uh, starting uh, some degree of antithrombotic therapy in everybody. I tend to favor those guidelines. The CCHAHRS guidelines were uh, really more recommending use of, uh, I, uh, of oral anticoagulants at higher CHADS VAS, but, but I don't think that's entirely true to the data, especially in the NOAC era. A big problem with oral anticoagulation, including uh, the NOACs, is that there's still underutilization of them. There's still this concern about fall risks and so forth, which uh, really is outdated thinking. 
And therefore, there are a lot of patients who should be getting uh, anticoagulation that aren't. So in terms of things that you can do is to make sure when you see patients that have AF, to make sure that they're anticoagulated. The efficacy of warfarin when it is compared with control is really risk reductions that we don't often see in cardiovascular medicine these days. In some cases, right around or exceeding 50% relative risk reductions. And if we then look at the NOAX or DOAX versus warfarin, a clear story for less hemorrhagic stroke, significantly less hemorrhagic stroke, translating into less all-cause mortality, about a 10% lower rate of all-cause mortality because of less intracranial hemorrhage. So really should be using uh, NOAX these days. Now, some issues with the NOAX uh, in terms of patients with low uh, uh, GFR or creatinine clearance, check the label to see what the dosing should be. In some cases for very low uh, GFR dialysis, these agents are contraindicated, though for some of them, like apixaban, in fact, it is on label. Uh, to use the 5-BID in dialysis. But if you're gonna do that sort of thing, you really wanna be very familiar with use of these drugs. Some issues with uh, use in pregnancy and nursing mothers, uh, well, pediatrics not so relevant for this audience, prosthetic heart valves, no acts are still contraindicated, uh, don't do it. Uh, conditions like uh, lupus anticoagulant, uh, there are still warfarin seems to be preferred. Uh, severe mitral stenosis, still warfarin. But other than that, in general, you want to be using the NOACs. Do be aware of some potential interactions with antiarrhythmic drugs and anticoagulants. Um, again, always best to check the package labeling or consult your pharmacist when you're using these agents. But in particular, be aware that drugs like amiodarone and dronetarone and rapamil and dotiazem uh, and uh, amiodarone and dronetarone uh, can all affect CYP3A4 and can therefore affect levels of DOAX. So uh, just uh, be cautious as you're combining these different drugs. As far as aspirin goes, really uh, the data clearly show that anticoagulation beats antiplatelet monotherapy. So really you shouldn't be using antiplatelet monotherapy or dual antiplatelet therapy as an alternative to anticoagulation. The dosing of the DOAX, again, it's different for different agents. The creatinine clearances and cutoffs are slightly different for these drugs. I wouldn't try to memorize this, and you can try to memorize it, but I, I would always consult the label. Probably best that you familiarize yourself with a couple of these, but on the other hand, different patients and formularies might force you to use different agents. So always consult the label and or your pharmacist, especially in patients that are at the extremes of weight uh, have low uh, uh, creatinine clearance in those sorts of people. Uh, it's, um, uh, there's some subtlety as far as the dosing goes. Uh, finally, just a couple of words about Watchman. Its use is growing. Uh, the data supporting it is uh, not super strong, to be honest, uh, but at least compared with warfarin, it does seem to be uh, an acceptable device in terms of safety and efficacy. Uh, the indications for it are, are listed here. Uh, there are a number of trials of other devices that are going on. So we'll have to see what those show. Well, you know, for the sake of time, I think I better wrap things up and just uh, leave you with this thought uh, that individualizing AF therapy is extremely important. Uh, there are lots of things to consider in terms of patient symptomatology uh, and uh, patient preferences. Uh, the guidelines are uh, in some cases a little bit out of date and out of sync with the data, but nonetheless form a good anchor in, in terms of the basis of knowledge with which you should be familiar with. And, and the keys really are rate control, increasingly, I think, rhythm control and strategies to prevent stroke, largely pharmacologic, but perhaps in the future also increasingly device-based. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, happy to take any uh, questions. I see one from uh, Dr. Pressman here in terms of do I use six minutes duration as the threshold for treating AF, even if asymptomatic. I I'm really waiting for data to show what the right threshold is, not just for AF risk, but actionable AF risk. That is where instituting a NOAC, for example, reduces the subsequent rate of stroke. While that hasn't actually uh, happened yet in terms of data showing what the threshold should be that's actionable. Uh, I'm not really doing anything other than noting it. Having said that, there's going to be an increasing number of patients to just show up with various durations of atrial fibrillation. And, you know, six minutes is a common cutoff that's used. Other people will say an hour or more is needed, you know, before there's substantial stroke risk. You know, I, I, I guess when I'm forced to make a decision on that patient that comes in and says, hey, 
you didn't order it, but this is what my device is showing. And then I confirm, you know, that they're having episodes like that. I, I actually calculate their CHADS VAS score and see what is their overall risk uh, and also assess their bleeding and, and do in fact end up treating some of those asymptomatic patients uh, with a little bit of uncertainty that I discuss and disclose and document with them and say, look, you know, we're not 100% sure what to do, but you've got high stroke risk based on your CHADS VAS score. In particular, though, in those patients, I don't double up. That is, if they were on aspirin for primary prevention, a shaky proposition sometimes anyway, I don't then just add an anticoagulant. And folks that are being anticoagulated for AFib, regardless of whether it's symptomatic, asymptomatic, uh, uh, something that is of um, a duration where everyone would agree uh, to anticoagulate, something that's of a duration that's controversial, I, I just use uh, NOAC alone. I don't use warfarin if I can help it. I don't use uh, uh, aspirin plus uh, the uh, NOAC because that increases bleeding risk with, in general, no uh, demonstrated incremental efficacy. Uh, the other question here was also from Dr. Pressman, but I answered already about the atrial myopathy. Well, good. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Now, if not, we're at the top of the hour, and I don't want to keep people uh, away from their clinical duties any longer than needed. Uh, and it looks like no other questions have come in. Well, in that case, let me close and thank you all very much for your attention. I hope this uh, review of atrial fibrillation was useful to you. Uh, again, thank you for everything that you're doing. It looks like there's especially a lot of uh, house officers in the audience here. Uh, keep up the great work and uh, best of luck to you in your careers. Thank you once again for the invitation to present.